The ancient art of meditation has moved out of the temple and into our daily lives. It's practiced by top class athletes, even taught in some of the most powerful corporations in the world. You don't have to be Buddhist to meditate. You just have to be a person with a functioning mind. New discoveries in science suggest it may indeed have benefits. 8%, that's enormous. <laughs> Boost memory and treat depression. I decided I was well enough to come off the medication. And meditation may even slow the ageing process. The studies are very promising. They actually do suggest there are benefits. From brain scans to blood tests, from the psychological to the biological, Depends what your definition of pain is. I'm going to investigate the hard evidence to see if meditation lives up to the hype. And I'm going to put my own brain to the test and undertake eight weeks of mindfulness meditation. Will it make me less stressed? Will it improve my memory? I did better at that. Will it change the structure of my brain? Londoner Nick Brewer is a yoga and meditation teacher. But life hasn't always been so serene. For 10 years, Nick ran a drug empire, smuggling cocaine out of Colombia. Essentially, I was quite a wealthy young man. I had a, a, a property asset holding company, a nightclub, restaurants, and you know, all the toys that go with it. You would have looked at me as being quite a successful entrepreneur, unless you knew what I do for a living. In 2004, he was arrested in South America and sentenced to prison there. It was probably one of the worst places you could ever imagine in your entire life. It was poor, it was broken, it was corrupt. You're anxious about absolutely everything. You're anxious about staying alive, about where your next plate of food's going to come from, if you've got any money, if you haven't got any money, um, you know, if you're going to get raped, um, killed. A year into his sentence, Nick was shown a book by his cellmate. You know, I asked him what he had, and he says, I've got a book on yoga. So obviously at the time, I said, you know, you must be some sort of weirdo. Soon, he was hooked and began practising yoga and meditation every day. It was the sitting practice and the yoga practice that helped me to, you know, find some kind of serenity in there. Nick transformed his life. I have a very happy life, extremely humble. I have a lot of amazing clients that I teach. So, you know, the last five years has been completely transformational. Like Nick, I guess, I'd never really contemplated whether meditation could do anything for me. But the more I hear about the research, the more keen I am to see whether it has any effect. So, I'm gonna try it myself for two months. Step one, learning how it's done. I'm off to see Dr. Richard Chambers, who's a clinical psychologist, but also an expert in mindfulness. He's going to teach me how to meditate, apparently. Mindfulness is a type of meditation where we focus our attention on the present moment, on the body, the breath, that kind of thing. Mindfulness meditation is the most well-researched type of meditation and just taking a few moments to check in and just notice the state that your body's in, checking in with the mind. Some scientists say it can boost physical and mental health and improve cognitive abilities. And when the mind inevitably wanders, just noticing that and see if you can bring it back gently without any further thinking. Most of us focus our attention on daydreams and distraction and rumination and worry and a whole bunch of stuff. If we can train ourselves, and we can, we can actually build a mindful muscle to train ourselves to be focused and present, just enjoy the moment more. Key to building this so-called mindful muscle is strengthening the prefrontal cortex. If the brain were an orchestra, the prefrontal cortex is like the conductor. When we notice our attention's wandered and we bring it back to the present moment, we activate the prefrontal cortex. It's forming new synapses, new connections and getting thicker and stronger, kind of like a muscle. And will I feel a greater sense of well-being or more relaxed or...? Why don't we wait and see what happens for you? I mean, I'm going to predict yes, but 
One of the best ways to learn mindfulness is through the doing. For me, to take meditation seriously, I need some hard evidence that it's changing my brain for the better. And that's the, uh, the weapon. It's the weapon. We'll uh, put one of these on you. It's an EEG cap. So I've come to see neuroscientist Dr Neil Bailey. He's about to put me through a raft of rigorous tests to get a measure of my brain power at the beginning of the eight weeks meditation. All right, Graham, looks like we've got some brain activity. Fantastic, contrary to popular opinion. <laughs> First up, an EEG to measure my brain's electrical activity. When we activate it, it will give you a gentle electrical shock. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it annoying but not painful at all? Oh, it depends what your definition of pain is. <laughs> yeah. The tests will measure my memory, my reaction time, and my ability to focus. You're to respond to the meaning of the emotion of the word and try and ignore the emotion on the face. OK, so angry face could have the word happy underneath. Exactly. Electrical activity in the brain is produced as neurons communicate with each other. The synchronised signals are brain waves. When you meditate, alpha and theta waves increase and activity in some parts of the brain decreases, allowing me to focus. The idea is, after eight weeks, the brain activity changes I experience during meditation will have a lasting effect on my brain. According to Dr Bailey, I'll be better able to concentrate, make faster decisions and remember more information. Most extraordinary though, my brain may even become more energy efficient. You're performing better, but your brain is exerting less energy. You're getting a decrease in neural activity. You might be able to do just as well in your job, but be exerting less mental energy. So when you get home, you're less tired. Beyond enhancing my brain's performance, I also want to know if meditation can have an even more dramatic effect and actually change its physical structure. I must say, I hate being locked in confined spaces. Not looking forward to this. So I've come for an MRI to have some before and after brain structure scans. This next one is going to go for about six minutes. Try not to think of anything. Just let your mind go blank. Recent research from Harvard University showed that just eight weeks of meditation can physically change the structure of the brain. Everything we do affects the brain. So any skill we learn, anything we practice will change the way our brain is structured. So over time, if you're repeating a practice, for example, mindfulness, it's going to strengthen certain connections in the brain and um, change the, the grey matter, for example, volumes of the brain. Grey matter is the darker tissue of the brain where most of the nerve cell bodies are. The Harvard research found that grey matter increased in key areas such as the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex and temporoparietal junction. And these are parts of the brain that help us to remember, to focus, to learn, to inhibit impulses and regulate our emotions. If we sat there daydreaming for 20 minutes, we'd be strengthening a different part or different parts of the brain. And we get to choose what we want to strengthen. We've got a, a use it or lose it brain. Now, it is early days for a lot of this research, but the possibility of meditation changing the structure of my brain certainly sounds exciting. I have to wait eight weeks to find out my results. I'd better start meditating. OK, the end of week one, it's now breathing meditation, and that's more challenging. You're just focusing on that one thing, your breath, which I find very easy to get distracted from that. But can meditation change the body as well as the brain? A handful of studies show it may be good for our health by reducing inflammation and stress hormones. So far, there's an interesting growing list of some of the different ways that meditation affects the body. The question US researcher Dr. Alyssa Appel wants to answer is, can it also slow down aging? been looking in particular at aging markers. By now, the field has a pretty good collection of very interesting studies that do suggest that there are benefits to our rate of aging. 
Signs of ageing can be seen inside the body's cells, specifically in the tiny caps at the end of each chromosome, known as the telomeres. Our telomeres protect our genes. Now, what happens as we age, our immune cells divide and the telomeres shorten. Those protective caps get shorter and shorter. So we want to keep those intact. Basically, the shorter the telomeres, the faster the ageing. Several studies have compared the telomeres of meditators to non-meditators. It looks like telomere length, that measure of how our immune cells age, stabilizes more and doesn't shorten in the meditation group. Other studies have measured telomerase, the enzyme that protects those precious telomeres. Those studies have suggested that telomerase can go up and telomere length can be better maintained during those periods. And, uh, you know, we wait for lots of replications before we say something is true or a fact. The studies are very promising, very suggestive. We've seen how meditation can change you biologically, but how about psychologically? One of the most widely studied areas of meditation research is the effect on mental health. Ross Bunn has been coping with depression for years. I wasn't really comfortable in my own skin. I was very sort of agitated, quick to anger. I didn't really feel I knew who I was. I was not doing the things I, I loved and enjoyed. I wasn't seeing my friends or family anymore. And uh, my relationship was, uh, well, strained, really. It was, it was very difficult. Ross was given medication, but he didn't like the side effects. It really didn't make me feel very well. I still didn't feel like myself. I was, still wasn't sleeping. I was still very agitated. I just felt pretty detached from everything and everyone. Ross is one of a growing number of people using meditation to treat their depression. I actually practice mindfulness whilst hiking. I find it's quite easy to, to focus on putting one foot in front of the other and then just noticing the world around me and, and then how my body feels. People who practice mindfulness show better mental health than 70% of the population on average. Uh, people with depression and anxiety have even larger gains than that. The data shows that that reduces depressive symptoms, but the big finding is that it halves the rate of depressive relapse. For people who've had three or more depressive episodes, if they learn mindfulness is, as part of their treatment, they're half as likely to get depressed again down the track. Indeed, for some, meditation could be an alternative to their medication. A paper that came out last year, a meta-analysis, has found that it's as effective as antidepressants for preventing relapse, which is a pretty significant finding. Did it make a difference to you? Yes, absolutely. Probably would have been about eight months or so. I've decided I was, I was well enough, uh, able enough to, to come off the medication. Dr Richard Chambers believes mindfulness meditation works because it breaks the cycle of depressive thoughts. Depressive thoughts that maybe go through people's minds that they don't normally notice, they're just running in the background like an app and reducing people's mood. So mindfulness helps them to notice that and then just to recognise it as a thought rather than taking it seriously, believing it, trying to push it away, which then gets the attention very much caught up in that kind of rumination. Just noticing it, let it go, bring the attention back to the present. Doing the meditation really helps break that rumination cycle. And overall, that allows me to focus on all, all sorts of things if I need to focus on work, not my mind's not wandering away thinking about something else. So it's, it's, it's training my brain to focus. That's the main aim. So how exactly does meditation train the brain? One of the things that many types of meditation do is exercise our attention muscle. And boy, that's an important muscle. This so-called attention muscle may exert some control over one of the brain areas tied up with emotion, the amygdala. 
when the amygdala gets activated, that's when we feel fear and anxiety and that sort of thing. Um, so its, its purpose is to give uh, experience an emotional salience. In something like depression or anxiety, it becomes overactive. And so it's, it's constantly activated and, and providing that sensation of anxiety or fear or um, hypervigilance. After meditation, other parts of the brain appear more in control of the amygdala. What happens is, in theory at least, and from what we can tell from the brain scans, when you've practised a lot of uh, mindfulness, both the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, those regions exert more regulation on the amygdala and uh, dampen the effect of that anxiety or fear coming up. Meditation's list of benefits does seem remarkable, and some are concerned media hype is falsely overselling them. After all, the research is still in its infancy. The few studies that have looked at it haven't found that mindfulness was any better than other forms of therapies, which in itself is, is not a bad outcome, but there simply isn't enough research Professor Farias believes certain people should exercise particular caution. All kinds of meditation were originally designed to rattle your sense of self. If there is something which has traumatised you in your life and you've forgotten about it by meditating, you may become aware of it and this will exacerbate all the symptoms. It can actually increase stress, it can lead to greater levels of anxiety, panic attacks in some people. There were times where I would dredge up past experiences that I, that I really didn't want to go back to. And it was really quite disturbing and, and confronting at the time too. I, I never expected for that to occur. Professor Farius also believes there may be an inherent bias in the research. 99% of the researchers have only been looking at the potential benefits, at the positive effects. They haven't really been asking people about the adverse effects. If you've got a psychotic disorder, if you're really anxious, or if you're getting it taught to you badly, maybe it's not going to be so, so good. Gee, when you're going through a stressful time, you've got a lot on your mind, it is really hard to get all that stuff out when you're meditating. I'm finding it really hard at the moment. It's time for a catch-up with Dr Richard Chambers. So I might just check in, how's your practice been going? I'm the scientific type, you know, I'd like to do a lot more experiments before I draw any conclusions, mm. but I'm feeling more relaxed than I have been for some time, and yeah. I notice the stress but it's not like I'm sucked into it. I just sort of cruise through, which is very good. Reducing stress is one of the most commonly reported effects of meditation. You know, the stress isn't actually in the situation. The stress is in our relationship with the situation. But stress is a complicated thing. We can't avoid stress. Stress is an embedded part of life. And in fact, engaging in new things and challenges is very good for us. But we need to make sure that we have enough reserve in our days, or at the least in our weeks. And that's where meditation might help. Meditation and mind-body activities are a wonderful way to build our kind of physiological and psychological resiliency. To get a better idea of how meditation works on a bigger scale, I've come to Nan Tian Temple to meet meditation teacher Chok Yin. She believes it has an important role to play in society. When I first started meditating, I remember I was telling everyone, this is the cheapest form of um, dealing with stress, anxiety that's available to you. It's totally free, really, because it's just you and your mind. Shokye is part of an international project teaching meditation to inmates in New South Wales correction centres. People get into prison 
And in one way you can say it's a bit like going into retreat, you know, because you go into a closed environment, a lot of things have taken away from you, and one thing you do have on your, is time on your hands. So what you're going to do now is you focus all your awareness strongly on the sensation at your nostrils as you breathe in and out. You just feel that. Take one more breath and you'll feel it, okay? She believes it improves mental health and aids rehabilitation. And it doesn't take very long to see the effects in a prison environment. Former inmate Nick Brewer experienced these benefits firsthand. There were deep shifts in my psychological patterns and thought patterns about the way I felt about myself and life. And it started a whole rehabilitation process. I think every one of us, whether we're in prison or out, and we look at our lives by not knowing what's going on inside ourselves until the words vomit out the mouth or until the fist does the, does the punch, you know, you, you kind of, you get into trouble in life. But they learn more about themselves. They learn what is it that triggers me? You know, what triggers me to anger? What triggers me to act out in, in ways, selfish ways or um, ways that do harm to others? Professor Farias studied the effect of meditation on prison inmates in South America. He believes it helps in some ways, but it's no magic bullet. We did find they became less stressed. They had a lower probability of having psychological problems. On the other hand, we also found out that there weren't differences in terms of aggression or interpersonal behavior, which was something we were looking for. My old self is very alien to me now. I, I can relate to the, the old Nick, the character, but from what I did, you know, it's dead. It's eight weeks later, and my personal trial has come to an end. Who would have thought I'd ever take part in a group meditation session? There you go. Anyway, my eight weeks is up now. I'm off for my results. Uh, I'm back to Monash to find out if all the dedication has paid off. Thank you. I'm keen to see if I've made a difference to my brain. Yeah, let's see. Three hours of cognitive tests and brain scans later... It wasn't bad this time. I've got to wait a week for the results, apparently, though. And it's results time with Dr Bailey and MRI expert Dr Chow Saw. Overall, uh, you did better in three of the five tasks. Better behavioural performance. Oh, that's fantastic. Not only that, you exerted less brain activity. So you spent less energy to do better. This one in particular was your memory task. I did um, better at that? You did better at that? I felt like I was guessing. That was a very hard yeah, task. It was very hard. Oh, yeah, that's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually one where we were um, distracting you with that tiny electrical shock. I remember yeah, it well. At the same yeah. time as you were trying to remember stuff. It feels so, like I, it's easy for me to intervene if my brain's doing something I don't want it to do. Yeah, that's cool. And that's, that's actually a really uh, interesting point for this next slide. Your reaction time to unexpected events, you cut your reaction time by 400 milliseconds. Really? It's almost half a second. Yeah. That's huge. It's massive. If you're driving a car and a pedestrian steps out in front of you, 400 milliseconds is probably a life-saving amount of time. That's very good news. Yeah, I feel like I passed. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I was better at the tasks, but had my brain physically changed? So what did my brain scan results show? All right, let's start with the structure changing uh, the three brain regions that has been reported before. There were indeed changes in my grey matter density in several parts of my brain. They're big changes in the scheme of things. Mm, yes, yes, that's a very interesting finding, yeah. Mm. The most dramatic change was in a part of my hippocampus known as the dentate gyrus, where new brain cells are produced in adults. 22.8 per cent. It's enormous. Yeah, it's huge. That's really large. And that means something's definitely going on. You've got what we call uh, neurogenesis happening. In other words, new brain cells were growing. And there's more. My hippocampus is also exerting more control over something called the default mode network, which is associated with anxiety. These changes are not usually seen in someone my age. Younger people show that pattern more than older people. It's as if my brain's getting a little bit younger. Yeah, you've, you've reversed the ageing process a little bit in, uh, in your brain. 
Who could complain about that? Now, sure. My personal experience is not a proper scientific study, so we can't say for sure these brain changes were the direct result of meditation. But hey, I'm impressed, and certainly feeling happy with my younger, heavier brain.